Today, we're going to talk about transitional organisms, but before we can start mentioning specifics, we must understand what a transitional organism is. In a broad sense, any organism that passes its genes on to progeny is transitional. It's the genetic transition between its parents and its offspring. Most people, though, think of a transitional organism as one that displays features of two different clades of organisms. For example, Tiktaalik is considered transitional because it displays features of fish and amphibians. It had fins, gills, and scales like a fish, as well as being considered a sarcopterygian fish, but it also had a head, neck, rib bones, pectoral girdle, and lungs like that of an amphibian. Tiktaalik also had features intermediate between both fish and amphibians, like having half-fish, half-tetrapod limb bones, joints, and a half-fish, half-tetrapod ear region. Ask a creationist what a transitional organism is, though, and you probably won't get an answer. Or you'll get an answer that is something we shouldn't expect in nature, like a crocoduck. The reason for creationists doing this is they know that if they ask you for something reasonable, then there's a fair chance we might actually find it. In Darwin's own day, he knew that lungfish and platypuses held some positions on the tree of life that were closely linked to other branches that were previously considered to be unrelated. We now know that lungfish are closely related to tetrapods, and monotremes, including the platypus, are the most basal living mammals, sharing characteristics with reptiles. That's what we're going to discuss today. We're going to talk about the evolution of mammals and their transition from earlier reptiles. We'll talk in this episode about the synapsid reptiles that gave rise to the mammals, and in the second episode in this two-part series, we'll talk about mammalian biodiversity. So let's jump in. Mammals and their ancestors compose a clade of amniotes called synapsids. Synapsida is a group of reptiles distinct from diapsids, which is comprised of the tuatara, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, birds, and turtles, and anapsids, which is only comprised of some extinct reptiles with morphological characteristics separate from the other two clades. The important morphological difference among these is that anapsids have no temporal fenestrae, and synapsids have one, while diapsids have two. The temporal fenestra is, for reference, a site for a jaw muscle attachment. The first synapsids look something like your average lizard. For example, Archaeothyrus looked no more mammalian than a gecko, nor did many of the earliest synapsids, often called pelicosaurs. The most basal synapsids are called caseosauria, and they look like large lizards. They live from the late Carboniferous to the middle Permian and were generally either small insectivores or large herbivores. After that, the pelicosaurs appear, the most primitive of which is Varanopidae. They also lived from the late Carboniferous to Middle Permian and might have lived like modern monitor lizards, which is why their names are similar. Monitor lizards are in Varanoidea, and some synapsids were in Varanopidae. Try not to confuse these. Next is Ophiacodontidae, comprised of varanid-like reptiles that may or may not have been semi-aquatic. More fossil evidence is needed to solve this question. From this point on, Pelicosaurus shows signs of achieving endothermy or warm-bloodedness by way of the massive sail on the backs of some. The first to try this were the herbivorous Edaphosaurus that lived from the late Carboniferous to the early Permian and were native to Europe and North America. Remember, at this time, Pangaea was forming. Another group of Pelicosaurs called these Phenacodontids were also evolving sails on their back, including the famous carnivorous Dimetrodon and the lesser-known crocodile-like Secodontosaurus. These reptiles survived from the late Carboniferous to the middle Permian, but it is probable that after this point, the synapsids were endothermic. Following the branching off of the Sphenacodontids, the remaining synapsids are grouped into a single clade called Therapsida. The most basal Therapsids lived from the middle to late Permian and were called the Biarmosuchians, lightly built carnivores that displayed intermediate characteristics between these Sphenacodontids and more advanced Therapsids. The next branch is a clade of large Therapsids called Dinocephalia, meaning terrible head, and were herbivorous, carnivorous, and omnivorous. They only lived during the Middle Permian, so they were not particularly successful. The next therapsids were the Anomodonts, who lived from the Middle Permian to the Late Triassic and were toothless herbivores. Of the Anomodonts, the only survivors of the Permian-Triassic extinction were the Diacynodonts, so-called because of their two prominent canines. Delving further into the therapsids, we encounter the Gorgonopsians, synapsids popular for being diverse carnivores existing from the Middle to Late Permian. Gorgonopsians are important to the evolutionary history of mammals because they may display the first signs of fur which is why they're grouped with mammals into a single clade called theriodonts. Like all the other therapsids, they were originally identified as mammal-like reptiles, but due to their similarities with mammals, they might as well be classified as stem mammals. One of the last clades of therapsids before we reach the mammals is Therocephalia, meaning beast head. They lived from the Middle Permian to the Middle Triassic and shared similarities with the more primitive Gorgon options and the more advanced therapsids. The final clade of mammals is called Cynodontia and is broken down into two sister clades called Cynognathia and Mammalia. Cynognathia lived from the early to late Triassic and its members were covered in fur. However, they lacked the mammary glands that later developed in true mammals. Some cynodonts were so mammal-like that they have even been previously classified as early mammals, like Oligokyphus. These near mammals had, like mammals, fur, erect limbs, endothermy, and lactation. However, they were still classified as non-mammals. 
Beyond them, we encounter the first true mammals. True mammals have many characteristics in common with reptiles, but they also gain more throughout their evolution, including a relatively much larger brain, only one lower jawbone, a specialized chewing mechanism, shearing back teeth, big ears, small bodies, a head and neck that allowed for a larger range of motion, more specialized vertebra, a palate in the roof of their mouth, and their teeth were a variety of shapes. The evolution of mammal ears was also significant in their development, as several jaw bones moved upward to become the malleus, incus, and stapes of the inner ear. It must be pointed out, though, that none of these specializations were completely novel, but built on older structures. So, mammals evolved from reptiles over the course of millions of years, and the transition from one class to another has been adequately depicted in the fossil record. So what will creationists do about all these transitional clades? They'll probably ignore the fossils completely or flatly deny that these synapsids have characteristics intermediates of both reptiles and mammals because that's what creationists do. At any rate, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.